We're from Mars. Don't be afraid. We have children just like you on Mars. Human beings have contemplated whether life exists beyond Earth for thousands of years. Ancient one of Mars, I call upon you. It's thought that there's a possibility that simple microbial life might exist within our solar system, but not advanced complex life. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist, it just means we don't expect to find it, largely because the conditions for life uh, elsewhere in the solar system appear to be extremely hostile to such life. But since the early 90s, technology has allowed us to locate planets outside of our solar system. They're known as exoplanets. And planet hunting telescopes like Kepler and TESS have discovered roughly 4,000 of them. And counting. So we now understand that majority of stars will have uh, planets. So planets are ubiquitous. And because we just reach that sensitivity that is allowing us to detect those exoplanets, this field is uh, evolving very rapidly. And while they're too far away to send a probe to even the closest exoplanets, a team at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory has been developing a method more powerful than any telescope ever built. It'll be able to give us a close-up look at planets and other objects thousands of light years away, find worlds that are similar to Earth, and maybe even discover signs of intelligent life. So that's what the Earth people call a city, eh? How primitive. Look at all those buildings above ground. And it will be an amazing discovery, first of all, to see that we are not alone, or in the, how life evolved in that system. So it's an enormous uh, step in our sort of philosophical understanding who we are and where we go. Powerful telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope, Spitzer, Herschel, and Keck Observatory have photographed objects very far away. This galaxy, called the Sombrero Galaxy, is 28 million light years from Earth. But even though known exoplanets are as close as four light years, these are the best images we have. All we really get are just these tiny little blobs. Um, they just look like fuzzy little points of light orbiting some distance from the star. So we don't really see anything that looks like a planet. In fact, if we didn't know any better, we might think that it was just a very, very faint star, when in fact it's a very, very large planet reflecting uh, the starlight off of it. And of the 4,000 discovered exoplanets, only about 50 of them have been imaged. So basically it's really, really hard to image an exoplanet. It's really hard but not impossible. And, and that's why we're aiming to do that. You know, that's why we're trying to make that happen. But you're right, it, it's very difficult. It's, it certainly is not beyond our uh, capabilities or won't be beyond our capabilities. The majority of exoplanets are found using the transit method, a tiny dip in a star's brightness when a planet passes or transits in front of it. And it's that telltale drop off in light, especially when it repeats over several cycles, that tells us that this is caused by a planet orbiting the star, making regular transits across its surface. Another common method is looking at slight shifts in a motion of a star when there's a planet orbiting it. This is known as the radial velocity or wobble method. The planet exerts gravity on the star. So what happens is that as the planet comes around the star, the star also kind of comes around the system's center of mass. And so the star has to move. Although both of these methods allow planetary scientists to make predictions, like the basic mass, size, whether it's rocky or gaseous, and distance to its host star, it doesn't allow us to see it. In the best case scenario, the light can be analyzed with modern telescopes to give hints as to whether the planet is habitable. How can we even tell that a planet is habitable just by a fuzzy blob? We, we certainly cannot. So the goal of, with these telescopes is not to actually show us what the planet looks like, but it would allow us to analyze the light coming from the planet. The spectrum of light coming from the planet can be analyzed to reveal the chemical components of its atmosphere. A much easier feat than getting a real-life image. That's because, in comparison to a galaxy, 
Exoplanets are dark and tiny. Planets just reflect light from their host star. So even though a planet may only be uh, a few dozen light years down the road, uh, our chances of seeing it are much less than seeing a bright star that's even farther or a bright galaxy that's billions of light years away. It's just the nature of the uh, luminosities involved. Even with the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope, which will be the most powerful space telescope ever built, the images won't give you much more than fuzzy blobs. What we want is an image where you can see color variations that distinguish oceans, continents, vegetation, and even see lights at night. That can determine not just if it's habitable, but show proof of advanced life. But to image an Earth-sized exoplanet that's 100 light years away at a decent quality, 1000 by 1000 pixels, you would need a telescope that is 90,000 kilometers in diameter, seven times larger than Earth. And even if it were made of a super lightweight material, it would still weigh about a trillion kilograms. In other words, it's not possible. What we need to do instead is rather than think about even building a telescope, we need to think about using nature itself as a kind of telescope. And luckily nature gives us a way to do that. Uh, this was discovered by Albert Einstein and, and it's the idea that mass or gravity can bend the path of light. As long as that can happen, then we can in theory go to where all those light rays that are being bent by a mass converges and we can take an image. This is called gravitational lensing. As long as we can choose the right place to put a telescope, we could in principle look back toward the sun, image the gravitational lens from a distant exoplanet, and for the first time we would actually be able to see continents. We'd be able to see uh, the oceans and map the coastlines of a Earth-sized planet maybe a hundred light years away. This is a very different approach to making images with a telescope that we could build here on Earth, but it may in fact be the only way that we'd be able to directly image the surface of another planet. It may sound like science fiction, but we've actually observed this phenomenon before. When light from a distant galaxy is behind a massive foreground object, from our perspective on Earth, the mass of that foreground object bends space-time, creating gravity and bending the light around that object. This forms a ring called an Einstein ring. To visually demonstrate this, you can use a wine glass to act as the lens or foreground object and a light bulb that can act as the source. If we, the observer, look through the center of the base of the wine glass, we see a ring of light. And in theory, we could use computer software to decode that ring of light back into its original state. If you replace the wine glass with the sun to bend the light, and sent a telescope, now the observer, to the point where the light converges, you could then take images of the ring and put it back together using software. The sun is massive enough that it will amplify whatever you're pointing it at by a factor of 100 billion, just like an astronomically massive telescope. That's why a team of scientists, led by Slava Turyshev at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, are proposing a solar gravitational lens mission. Flying a small telescope to the solar gravitational lens will allow us to study those objects in very fine details and confirm the presence of life and uh, study the evolution of life on that exoplanet. There are a few challenges though. For this to work, the telescope will need to be positioned past the convergence point at around 650 astronomical units, or AU, from the Sun. One AU equals the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Neptune is at 30 AU, for example. In Voyager 1, the furthest man-made object that was launched in the 70s, is currently at about 150 AU. So we have thought about how we can reach those distances. What technology do we have? And essentially, we realized that using chemical propulsion is very challenging because the fastest velocity we were able to achieve with chemical propulsion uh, was achieved with the New Horizons mission to Pluto. And New Horizons was able to reach roughly three astronomical units per year. 
With this velocity, it will take us a lot of time to get to solar gravity lens. So we realized that solar uh, sailing offers a unique alternative. With solar sailing, we are using the solar photons, solar light, to gain a very significant momentum that will push our sail craft to very high velocity. Solar sailing has been successfully demonstrated by the Planetary Society, NASA, and the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. If done in a way that Slava and his team are proposing, which involves flying close to the sun, the telescope will reach speeds of roughly 25 AU per year. So with those velocities, we will be able to reach solar gravity lens within, uh, I would say, 20 to 25 years. That's the only way to do this. The next challenge is once you get to 650 AU, there's no slowing down. But this is where they get a lucky break. It doesn't have just a single focal point. It has a focal line. If you fly a spacecraft towards the focal region of the solar gravity lens, we don't have to stop. Moving along that focal line will still benefit from that large amplification. Another challenge, which current telescopes also face when imaging exoplanets, is that you have to point the telescope at a very bright object, in this case, the sun. This creates a glare, which needs to somehow be blocked out in order to see the planet. We will use a very interesting technique called a coronograph. So the our star shade, it's a large instrument that is, uh, has to be flown in front of our telescope in space. And that coronograph will allow us to block the light from parent star and suddenly the very faint light from the exoplanet may present itself. So it's a challenging technique because the brightness mismatch. Fortunately, coronagraphs are being developed and in use on many planet hunting telescopes, including the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope. Finally, the telescope will be limited to choosing a single target since changing the angle by just a degree could mean propelling it billions of kilometers in the lateral direction. Usually people, when talking about solar gravity lens, there is a significant limit because we currently are limited by propulsion capability. So we can think that we can fly only towards one target, essentially. And so I'm, I think about solar gravity lens mission as like any planetary exploration. If you fly towards Saturn, we study the whole a set of satellites, uh, the whole family of satellites around Saturn with, with Cassini. If you fly around Jupiter with Galileo, we are studying multiple satellites of Jupiter. With the solar gravity lens, flying towards a TRAPPIST, we can study every planet in that system. The TRAPPIST system is a star with seven planets orbiting it, three of which are in the theoretical habitable zone, the sweet spot for a planet to possess liquid water on its surface and possibly support life. Pointing the telescope at the TRAPPIST system could be a solution for looking at multiple planets since they orbit the same star. Another way they're looking to solve this is to build the telescopes cheaply and send many of them. These are just a few of the hurdles that Slav and his team face, but none of them are out of reach. And what we realize is that most of those technologies already exist. Some of them in a very high technology readiness level. Some of them are yet to reach a very reasonable technology readiness level, but all of them exist in one form or another. Most of this technology is being developed alongside other projects that need to get far out into interstellar space cheaply and in a reasonable amount of time. So ultimately, we will trust those engineering uh, developments to allow us to explore further, more, at a very affordable cost. Solar gravity lens is our ultimate goal so far. But looking at, at this, we realize that there are plenty of synergistic efforts within the uh, exploration community, and we benefit from them. We benefit from those efforts, and we invite our colleagues and friends to join, uh, in, uh, to join us uh, to, to look at those technologies, how we can use those technologies in the near term, how those technologies will benefit us in the next 5-10 years. Slav and his team received Phase 3 funding from the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program and are developing methods to reconstruct the image from an Einstein ring, as well as building instrument prototypes. They hope to launch their technology demonstration mission in the next three to five years. So as of now, if you could choose one target for the solar gravitational lens, what would you choose and why? Oh man, only one? Uh, <laughs> 
let's uh, take a picture of our closest neighbor. So the Proxima, right? So Proxima B, it's our neighbor. The closer the exoplanet is, the larger its image and therefore the more detail we will be able to see. Uh, the closest star to our solar system, Proxima Centauri, is only 4.2 light years away and it has at least one but probably two planets orbiting it. I would love to use the SGL on that to see what the planetary system next door looks like. It's possible that once we get a close-up look at our nearest neighboring solar system, we'll be able to find out once and for all whether we're alone, or at the very least, get a detailed image of an exoplanet for the first time. Slav and his team hope to launch their first mission to image an exoplanet in the next 12 to 15 years. So it's only, you know, short 40 years from today. You and I may discuss the uh, images of, uh, you know, life present on a different exoplanet. And this is how the uh, childhood dream may realize for many of us. So now we will have a clear understanding, yes, we are not alone. And oh, by the way, our life is excellent. Or maybe we just have a confirmation that those aliens use, you know, carbon fuel as stupidly as we do. Or maybe they come up with something excellent and we we'll learn from them. But anyway, I think it's exciting opportunity for us to step above our daily lives and uh, think about what our universe will tell us about ourselves. So while we're never going to solve every problem on Earth, we can solve most of them. And in addition to reducing the pain of life on Earth, we can also increase the excitement of being alive in the first place. And that's what missions like the Solar Gravitational Lens and these next generation of space telescopes are allowing us to do. And there's something just fundamentally essential about learning about our real true place in the cosmos and understanding how it works. <laughs>